Let us read the Bible together. And let us examine these verses of Scripture. Let's start at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, verse 11, if God so loved us, let us also ought, we ought to also ought love one another. And we begin our exegesis. I want us to first notice here at verse 8 that it talks about this great thing that God is, that He's love. Now everybody in this room, we have a capacity for love. And some people possess that capacity and that's a communicated attribute that you have that you can love your neighbor. You can love your family. You can love your children. And you have that attribute down in your heart. You have that ability in your heart to love. But the Bible is clear. God does not possess the attribute of love. God is love. So I ask today, can one love their family? Can one love their neighbor? Can one love their children? Can a person love their spouse if they don't love God? If you don't know God, you cannot love because God is love. And that's a fact of Scripture. Look at verse 9. And we're going to see the things that surround this title, the only begotten Son. The first thing that I want us to notice that surrounds this title in this particular verse of Scripture concerning the only begotten Son is here at verse 8. And he says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent His only. I want you to underline that. God sent His only. That is the power of the title. In and of itself, it is the power of the title because God only had one to sin. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ. God who is the former of all things. God is who is the inheritance of the nation of Israel and the inheritance of the whole earth. God who stepped out 7,000 years ago and spoke this vast universe into existence. God who created man out of the dust of the ground. And God who breathed into man the breath of life. God who is rich in mercy. God who dwells in heaven and inhabits heaven above and the earth beneath where the streets are paved with gold, where the walls are made with jasper, where the city is 1,500 feet high. That God who is the possessor of all things, the substance of all things, when it came to redemption, He only had one to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the divinely exclusive Son of God. And I don't care who comes along lately. I don't care what false denomination. I don't care what cult in Utah can bring up Joseph Smith or Brenham Young or any other name that has ever been named among the realm of mankind. There is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus was exclusively the divinely virgin-born Son of the living God. He's it. He's it. Because Jesus is the only Son of God, the only begotten of God, the first begotten of God. Jesus could say in John chapter 11 that I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh to the Father except by me. That is the power that surrounds the title of the Lord Jesus Christ that I can stand and say that no other price in my hand I bring but simply to the cross I cling. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name, the only powerful Son of God. That's the power. But not only is there a power surrounding this title, there is a purpose of this title. Look at, him, look at verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world. And here's where we come in. That we might live through Him. Yeah. Our only source of life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave the divine objective of His ministry. He said, the thief cometh not but to kill and to steal and to destroy, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it 
more abundantly the purpose of us knowing the name, the only begotten Son of God, the purpose of the manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ is you. That you might live through Him. And Him only is the only way to life. Not only do we see this great purpose, but let's look at the provision of the title. Herein is love, verse 10, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. I want you to underline that word, the propitiation for our sins. That Jesus is the exclusive sacrifice for our sins. That He is the powerful only begotten of the Son, a Father. That He is the powerful uh, One that provides the way of salvation. But Jesus is the only way that we can have atonement, a propitiation for our sins. Under the Old Testament economy, the priest would take the blood of a lamb and he would go back into the sanctuary, into the holies of holies, and he would sprinkle blood on the ground and then he would drip mud a blood on the mercy seat as an atonement for our sins, for the sins of the nation of Israel. The place where the priest would sprinkle the blood was called the place of propitiation. And one thing the Old Testament teaches us is that for 1,500 years, there was a conditioned response in the nation of Israel to the people of God that He set forth in that Old Testament dispensation of time that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But Jesus is not just a propitiation for our sins. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. One day when death takes this feeble mortal body and I stand by for God and he says to me by what right do you enter in to heaven I'm not going to say by the blood of a bull by the blood of a goat by the ashes of a red heifer I'm not going to talk about the doctrine of election or Calvinism I'm not going to mention Pope Francis or the sacraments I'm not going to mention water baptism or the gift of speaking in tongues I'm going to say by what prerogative do I enter into heaven is by nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can tell you today that what can wash away my sins and your sins is nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make my feeble heart and decrepit mind and spirit whole again is nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other found anyone has ever known. Nothing, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The, the, the propitiation for our sins. But not only is there a power, not only is there a purpose, not only is there a glorious provision, there is a product of the title. If I love Him, if I know Him, here's the product. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, and He did, we ought also to love one another. That is the great product of Jesus coming into the world. That He teaches us to love one another. Amen. And it's important that every Christian does so. But not only do we see a wonderful power, not only do we see a wonderful purpose, not only do we see a singular and divine provision, not only do we have a wonderful product that exists among the saints of God, but because I believe it, God left us many infallible proofs Look over at the first chapter of John's Gospel and you said, Pastor, every time you preach on a Sunday morning, you preach out of the Gospel of John. That's because I haven't found anything yet, yet to rival the Gospel of John. It is the world's greatest work of literature. And if this man wasn't inspired by the Holy Ghost, this little Galilean fisherman, if he made this up, then we're dealing with a creative genius that would far surpass Shakespeare or Hemingway or any other author the world has ever known if the Gospel of John is not history, but it yeah. is. And it's so. And it's fact. Look at what God says concerning this title through His servant John. Verse 15, John bear witness of Him. This is the second greatest man that ever lived in the New Testament dispensation of grace. And cried saying, This is He of whom I spake. 
He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, before me. And of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Verse 18, I want you to underline that no man has seen God at any time. During the Old Testament when Moses went up on Mount Sinai in the glory cloud, he got to meet with God for 40 days. Moses stood in the presence of God and spoke to God. He felt the power of God, but he never got to see God. Exodus chapter 33 at verse 20, he said, Thou canst not see my face, Moses, for no man can see me and live. It is impossible for you to view all my holiness. All of the great preachers, all of the great prophets, all of the great kings, all of the great priests of the Old Testament, none of which were allowed to behold God the Father. None of them were allowed to see the full manifestation of God during the Old Testament. But the Apostle Paul writes to us in the New Testament at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 at verse 6. He said, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, to shine in our hearts the glory of of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. That God that had been concealed up in a glory cloud. That God that had dwelt in the deep dark recesses of the tabernacle and the temple at Jerusalem. That same God that all the Shekinah glory abode within His divine presence and through His divine personality. That same God that illuminated mankind's hearts and minds through His Word. That same God that had called out the nation of Israel to be a peculiar your treasure and a people. That same God that had defended them against their enemies, He dwelt in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ bodily in 2,000 years ago over next to the Jordan River. There He emerged. And John couldn't help himself. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the entire world. He hath declared Him. He hath declared Him. We saw Him. This same Jesus, we saw Him. He dwelt among mankind. But good news today, out on the Mount of Olives after His Passion Week, after His resurrection, two men appeared in white apparel as they watched Him go into the heavens and they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, this same body, this same person, He shall come again in like manner. And I believe that Jesus is coming again. I believe that Jesus has been declared to be the Son of God with power. I believe there are many infallible truths. Proof number one, and write this down. Nobody ever had a message like the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the divinely only begotten of the Father. He is the only begotten Son of God. And I know this through His divine message. Now, when I was a young man, 13 years old, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. with my mother and my father and my baby brother. And we went to Washington, D.C., and my mom and dad went to the presidential prayer breakfast with Congressman Hal Rogers. And he's been a good friend of this church, and he's been a good friend of my family. And I thank God for Congressman Hal Rogers every time I drive through these glorious tunnels that we have right here in the mountains. But mom and dad got to go see the president and me and my brother had to stay in the room. And they told us not to bother anything and they told us under no circumstances are you to leave. When we conclude, we'll come and get you. Congressman Rogers sent his aide over and knocked on the door and they took us over to the building where all the congr congressmen and senators have their offices. And then Congressman Rogers took me and my little brother on a private tour of the Capitol building. He took us into the Senate chambers and stood us next to the desk of Daniel Webster. And we stood there with that famous orator from Massachusetts that when he would speak, they would crowd the Senate chambers to hear what Daniel Webster had to say. Then he took us over to the congressional chamber and he let us stand up there behind that podium. A podium you'd be familiar with because that's where President Donald Trump just stood and gave the State of the Union address. But not only Trump, President Abraham Lincoln stood there. Winston Churchill, the greatest orator of the 20th century, stood there and sparked this nation to fight against Nazism and the Japanese. He stood there. President Roosevelt stood there and gave his famous speech that December 7th is a day that will live in infamy. And with these feet, I've stood in that place, in the place of great orators. 
And I thought that was something. Yeah. And I still do think it's something. But last year, I jumped on an airplane. And I went over to a little grassy field next to a lake in Cana of Galilee. And I stood in the place where He that was altogether lovely, He that it pleased the Father that in Him the Godhead should dwell bodily, Him that is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, Him that stood over there next to Jericho and met with Joshua, Him that met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings and blessed Him, He that was the only begotten Son of God. I stood in the place of Christ where He delivered that great oration, the Sermon on the Mount. No other thing ever been like it. And there never will be another thing like it. But Jesus is great in His message because in John chapter 15, at verse 15, He said, Henceforth, I call you no more servants. And the Greek word for servant is slave. He said because a slave, a servant, does not know where his master goeth. But I call you friends. Everything I've heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Every moment of the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly life was in perfect accordance with the will of God. Every word that Jesus ever spoke was God's words being spoke. Every thought that Jesus ever had was the inspiration of God. In a human mind, Jesus said, I must work the works of Him that sent me. Jesus had a divine message. And still yet to this day, no matter what dictators may do in communist countries, no matter what clerics may do in Islamic countries, no matter what atheist and agnostic intellectuals may do in liberal countries of Europe, the message of Jesus transcends all borders. It breaks through all barriers. It's went out from that little place of Galilee and Judea and Samaria. And it's been preached around the whole world. Preached to us Gentiles for our salvation. The message of Jesus proves that He's the only begotten Son of God. But not only did Jesus have a divine message, Jesus had a divine motive. If you want to write down this verse of Scripture, it's Luke chapter 19 at verse 10. And Jesus said, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. For I came down from heaven, John chapter 6, verse 38, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. And in that glorious stroke, in John chapter 6, we learn about the doctrine of the Trinity. And it's so miraculous. It's so incredible. It's so unbelievable that we can barely fathom it in human minds. In that they all three have a separate will, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But they act in perfect accordance with one another's will because they're in perfect unity one with another. Jesus said, it's not my will that sent me, but it's the will of the Father that sent me. It was His plan before the foundation of the earth, but it was also my plan because I agreed to be the Lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Jesus was in perfect accordance and His motive was one thing and one thing only, and it's what you see in the mirror every morning. You were the motive. What's the reason of the virgin birth? You. What's the reason of His sinless life? You. What's the reason of His vicarious death? You. What's the reason of His glorious resurrection? You are the reason. And I am the reason. And I don't care what theologian with how many degrees comes up with what. With all confidence and assurance and a full heart of faith, I can look at every man every woman, every boy, every little girl, and I can say to their face, Jesus died for you. If you would have been the only one, Jesus would have came and He would have died because He was in perfect accordance with the will of God. He was the divine exhibition of the personality and the love of His heavenly Father. He said, Philip, have you been so long with me? When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Not only did He have a divine message that proved He was the only begotten Son, not only did He have a divine motive that proved He was the only begotten Son, but Jesus had a divine mission that proves He was the only begotten Son of God. And you say to me, Pastor, what was His mission? Jesus did not come to earth primarily to live a sinless life. And I know some of you were probably expecting me to preach on Palm Sunday But can I tell you, the people at Palm Sunday, they missed it. 
Because they laid down palm branches and they cried Hosanna and they jumped and they rejoiced. If they'd have known Him like I've known Him, there would have been no jumping. There would have been no rejoicing. There would have been only kneeling and weeping. They couldn't have even opened their mouth if they'd understood exactly who Jesus was. This week is the week of His passion. We find it over in Luke chapter 20 when Jesus was in the temple and He was questioned. Now, I've been questioned a lot of places. I've had people bring up things that I say in sermons all the time when I'm out in public. But I've got news for everybody here. You're not coming to my parents' house today. You're not coming to my father's living room and standing before me and asking me questions in my father's house. You're not welcome. You're not invited. Jesus was assaulted. Jesus was questioned. Jesus was tried to be made look like a fool in His own father's house in the temple. They asked Him all these questions. Wish I had time to preach on all the questions they asked the Lord Jesus Christ. But then they delivered Him up. They delivered Him up to Pontius Pilate. But when that arraignment, in that dialogue that takes place, and it's one of the greatest dialogues in human history between the Lord Jesus Christ and probably the most pitiful man that's ever existed in history. Pitiful Pilate. In that dialogue, Pilate asked Him these great questions. Questions to which he knew the answer to. Some of which he did not. But in John chapter 18, Pilate asked him, he said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, did others tell you this or did you come to this knowledge on your own? Am I a Jew? It's your own people that delivered you unto me. Your own priest, your own nation. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants rise and they would fight. They would fight. Pilate said, are you then a king? Jesus said, to this end, I was born for this cause. And I could preach all day right there on this cause. One singular cause. Came I into the world that the glory of God might be revealed. Jesus then said, And everyone that heareth my voice heareth truth. And I bear witness unto the truth. Jesus came into the world for one reason and one reason only. And that's redemption. Jesus came into the world to destroy sin at the cross. Jesus came into the world to destroy sin. Now we can all get real high and we can all get real pious on who we are and what we've done and our accomplishments and our personality and how winsome we are. But I still believe what the old songwriter wrote. Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Jesus came to love the unlovely. Jesus came to die for the undesirable. Jesus came to give consolation to the doomed and the damned. And Jesus put sin and death to an open shame at the cross of Mount Calvary. Jesus came to destroy sin. Jesus came to provide a way of redemption. And I believe that one day when we all get over yonder, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and we'll shout the victory. I believe that we'll join in a glorious symphony. I believe that we'll join in heaven's chorus with the angels, those ministers of God. But I do believe that when we get over yonder, and we get to redemption song that the angels themselves will have to be silent because they have not known what it is to be redeemed from the penalty of sin, from the curse of sin, and from the burden of sin. Jesus, the way of redemption. And that's why He came. That was His mission. To destroy my sin and to destroy your sin on the cross. But Jesus not only came to destroy sin, Jesus came to defeat death. 